are working our way on through with various uh, uh, prayers. That's the way we've, we've deemed it. It's, in other words, communicating with God. Again, they don't communicate the same way we do. Some of them have direct contact, Moses being one of those that gets to speak to God directly. But nonetheless, he does things in his speaking to God uh, that we do in our prayer life. And uh, that, that's what we're looking at. So tonight, we're going, we're going to begin by looking in the wilderness. Remember last week, we, we dealt with Moses' excuses. God, God handled every one of those and, uh, and told Moses it was his job. Go do it, you know, basically. Well, Moses did it. We're, not, we're skipping over all of that because there's very little uh, communication be- between Moses and God. It's more God speaks to Moses to speak to Pharaoh is most of what you have until the children of Israel are released from Egyptian bondage and they get into the wilderness. And in chapter 15 of Exodus, we find uh, that it begins with what's often called the Song of Moses. Uh, He's singing about what God's done for them, the great victory uh, that they have had. Then you've got the Song of of Miriam, uh, his sister, much shorter, but still the same idea uh, is set forth there that God has blessed them uh, greatly. So we get to verse 22 of Exodus chapter 15, and here's what we find. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, Then they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. And he said, If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I'll put none of these diseases on you, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. So uh, in this case, uh, we, we've got... Uh, Moses crying to the Lord. Why? Because the people uh, were crying to him. And, and you, you've got to, in my life, I have to think about, and we talked a little bit about this last week, that, that uh, sometimes uh, that, that's maybe the best thing I could do is, uh, you know, things at home with children don't always go the way you want them to. And uh, they're fussing and complaining and so forth. Maybe you better turn over to the Lord. Uh, sometimes. Um, I do better doing that than I would sometimes reacting the way that I might want to react. You know, so uh, Moses does that. God takes care of it. And God actually makes a great promise uh, to them. We're, we're not really teaching the book of Exodus per se, uh, but the, the promise is you're not going to have any of these diseases if you do what I tell you to do. Uh, and uh, they are blessed that way as long as they continue to follow God's will. All right, pick up at uh, uh, Exodus chapter 17, another incident there. Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. We looked at this last week briefly also. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? What did Moses do? He went to the Lord. Again, think about it. Got a problem? Take it to the Lord. Don't try to solve it yourself. So Moses cried to the Lord saying, What shall I do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people, take all with you some of the elders of Israel, also take in your hand your rod with you, uh, with which you struck the river, and go. Behold, I'll stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it, and that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So Moses asked, he presented his problem, 
God took care of it. Now, I do want to make an observation. Uh, this, this is one that was presented to me a number of years ago by a preacher. He said, have you ever noticed that God waits sometimes until the last minute to solve the problem? Think about crossing the Jordan. Uh, how, when did the waters of the Jordan part? And the answer, of course, is when the soles of the priest's feet touch the water. Now, I'd say that's, that's pretty much last minute. Uh, we we are, are impatient people. You, you can't wait anymore, and I'm included, okay? You is generic, it's all of us. Can't wait anymore for the... For the uh, meatloaves get done in the oven, you 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 got to finish it in the microwave, or maybe cook the whole thing in the microwave, uh, it's good so we can get it faster. You know, coffee. Who has time to brew coffee? Just you know, get me a Keurig that'll turn it out in one minute, or whatever it is, or or pop some instant in, uh, heat the water up in the in the microwave and and pop some instant in it. Let's we're in a, we're in a hurry. Well, God works uh, on his schedule. You see that here. He works on his schedule. And uh, we need to remember that. We'll see more of that uh, as we uh, go along. Ch turn to chapter 32. Now, this is uh, another incident. And, uh, and again, we glanced at some of these last week, but we're trying to flesh them out uh, or pick up other points as we go along. 32, begin at verse 1. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. In this case, you know what happens. Uh, God just is prepared to kill him. He just says, just wipe him out. At least that's what he says to Moses. Now, I've wondered, is, is God really prepared to kill them? Or is he, is he building Moses as a leader? I don't think I'll know the answer to that until I get to heaven and I can ask God, okay, tell me about this. I do know this, though, uh, on the, the side of this is exactly the way God was thinking. Uh, you look at the book of Jonah and hear what Jonah's message is to Nineveh. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. That's the message. Did God mean what he said? I believe he did. What, what made the difference then? Why did he not kill them? Because they repented. They changed their ways. In this case, uh, God doesn't kill them because Moses pleads for them. And, and then, of course, Moses has got to go down and deal with them. And he does, as we see uh, in, in the progression of this chapter. Turn to Numbers chapter 11. Numbers is, in, is uh, filled, really, with their, if you would, their adventures in the wilderness. And we see good news, bad news, you know, throughout. Uh, but in ver chapter 11, verse 1, Now when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, for the Lord heard it. And his anger was aroused. So the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some in the outskirts of the camp. Then the people cried out to Moses, and when Moses prayed to the Lord, the fire was quenched. So he called the name of the place Taberah, because the fire of the Lord had burned among them. Do we plead for God's people? We asked that question last week. I hope it's motivated all of us to pray more this week for the brethren, for one another. Everybody here needs help and strength. Uh, I make it a pretty regular habit uh, to pray for the whole church and then specify certain ones. We got sick that we can talk about. Uh, they're, they're dealing with various issues. Uh, we've got, uh, of course, the deacons who are striving to serve among us. And then we've got our shepherds who are watching out for our souls. Uh, when it comes to the shepherds, for sure, I name them, I name them one by one. They need, they need prayers, not because they're bad men, but because they've got a very important job. You know, we're supposed to pray for those in authority, in government. You know, we think, think about uh, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, 
But what about the elders? They've got authority right here. They've got authority over us. They're watching for our souls. Boy, I want them to be tuned in, don't you? If I'm struggling, I want them to pick up on it. I want them to do something about it. So here's you know, Moses praying. He prays for the people. And, uh, and God ultimately spares them as a result. Go, go on to verse 4. Now the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? It, isn't it remarkable that God takes care of one problem with the people and they come up with another thing to complain about? They go right from one to the other. Now, you might say, well, you know, it's time. maybe it's time for prayers to cease. Okay, let's watch and see. Uh, but now our whole being is dried up. There's nothing at all except this manna before our eyes. Read a little bit about that last week. Now, the manna was like coriander seed, and it's color, uh, like the color of bedellum. Uh, the people went about and gathered it, ground it on mills, or beat it in the mortar, cooked it in pans and made cakes of it, and its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. When the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna fell on it. Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, everyone at the door of his tent, the anger, and the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. And Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant? Why have, you not, have I not found favor in your sight? that you've laid the burden of all these people on me. Did I conceive these people? <laughs> so, he did, so do you ever get frustrated? What do you do when you get frustrated? Keep it to yourself? Take it out on somebody else? What did Moses do? He took it straight to the Lord. Now he, it's very plain, plain it says he's, he's, he's agitated. He's angry, just like the Lord is. Uh, when he approaches the Lord. I, I don't think it's wrong for us to approach God when we've got that kind of struggles in our lives. I fear that we've, that we've made people embarrassed that they won't approach the Lord, but they should. we all should approach the Lord when we've got a problem, even, even when we're angry. That's a good time to approach Him because we don't want the sin, we don't want anger to lead to sin, which is what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 4. We want to remember that ourselves. Uh, so, of course, God had a remedy uh, for that. Uh, he, first of all, had Moses select, or select 70 men, he and the people. And those people were given a certain a power, the spirit of Moses, to an extent, so they could help judge the people. And then God gave them meat. But he kind of made it plain, I'm going to give them enough meat, I'm going to let them eat meat till it runs out their noses. That's how much meat I'm going to give them. I'm going to, I'm going to show these people what it's all about. And so, uh, and so he, he does respond uh, to what uh, Moses has to say, and he does provide uh, for, for, the, for the people in that particular case. Now, let's go backwards a little bit and think about Moses pleading for the people of God. Uh, Exodus chapter 32 is one of those cases. We've looked at some of these, so we won't, we won't uh, read and detail them out, but we're going to think about them briefly. Exodus chapter 32. Uh, look, look what he says, beginning in verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down, that's, that's the mountain situation. What, what, did, what did he do? He, he pleaded with God on behalf of the people. Uh, and God's, God's prepared to kill them. Let me alone, verse 10, that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them, and, uh, and I will make of you a great nation. But he forced Moses to do what? To think about the promise. What had God promised? What, what was God's thinking on the matter? Moses had that re- uh, recalled in his mind because of what's going on. So he pleaded for the people. Turn to Numbers 14, different case. Uh, this is when the children of Israel are uh, really the first time they're ready to enter the promised land. I don't know if we remember that or not. But they arrived on the borders of the promised land. They're ready to go in. 
They should have gone in, but but they did not. And so uh, pick up verses 11 and 12 there. They've turned down the two spies, Joshua and Caleb, and they've, they're going along with their being led astray by the ten spies. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me with all the signs which I have performed among them? I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them, and I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. There's God's point. I'm tired of it. I'm going to make a new nation. All right. So what does Moses do? He goes to God, talks to him. Listen, Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear it. For by your might you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. They have heard that you, Lord, are among these people, that you, Lord, are seen face to face, and your cloud stands above them, and you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day, and in a pillar of fire by night. Now if you kill these people as one man, then the nations will have heard of your fame, will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he killed them in the wilderness. All right, keep going. And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying, The Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the Father's on the children to the third and fourth generation. Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you've forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Pray for the people. What do you pray? Do what? They'd be forgiven. Do you notice he's, he doesn't say, just take them the way they are. Uh, we got to be careful that we, that we don't approach God and ask Him to accept a, a person still living in sin. But we got to pray He'll forgive them, and, and then we've got to, which Moses does, we've got to try to help them change so that they'll be what God wants them to be. I think that's, that's very important. So pick up now at uh, verse 20, same place. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. Do you ask God to, to forgive people here? People that respond to the invitation, do you pray for them? We should. If you know somebody that's struggling, do you go to them and try to encourage them to change and pray with them? Well, we should. See, that's, that's a part of bringing them along. It's what Moses did for these people. But then God goes on, but truly as I live, all the earth should be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all these men who see my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and put me to the test now these ten times and not heeded my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I'll bring into the land where he went his descendants shall inherit it. Now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn and move out into the wilderness by way of the Red Sea. So God heard him. He forgave. But does, does forgiveness mean there's no consequence for the sin? And the answer to that is no. There, there still can be consequences. You know, thankfully, in the time I've been here, I don't know of anybody that's gotten crosswise with the law. I'm talking in a really bad way. Some of us may have gotten a speeding ticket. I don't know. But, uh, but I'm talking about really crosswise with the law. That hadn't happened since we've been here. If, but if it did happen and somebody came and asked for the prayers of the church, could we pray for them? Sure we could. But should we expect that God's going to get them an acquittal? I don't think so. God didn't acquit these people. He forgave them, but he didn't acquit them. 
They still had to deal with their sin. They still got they still got an answer for it. All the whole generation wiped out, except for two men, Joshua and Caleb. That's it. It's all that's left. So it's it's kind of an interesting thing to watch the prayers of Moses. Now go on down to uh, by the way, when he mentions the Amalekites and Canaanites, why do they turn back toward the wilderness? Because those are the two war, warring people. You, you, don't want, you don't want Israel to go up against these warriors. Not at this moment. They're not ready. They're not ready to face them. And so God protects his people you know, so that they can remain alive until he can train them further. All right, chapter 16, another incident. Start at verse 20. <clears throat> and the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. <laughs> What's wrong? This is Korah's rebellion. And Korah's got a group of men, and what they're trying to do is they're, they're basically trying to take over. Uh, they pretty much say to Moses, who made you boss? <laughs> you know, that's, that's pretty much the deal. They rebel, they're rebelling against God, and God's angry. So the, verse 22, then they fell on their faces, that's Moses and Aaron, and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with all the congregation? Okay, good question. And again, he's putting it to him in prayer. He's, he's putting it out there. Yes, Korah had a group that was with him, but it's not the whole, it's not the whole nation. It's not all the people. And so he, he prays for the people that they, won't, that they won't be hurt with them. Now, how's that? Is there anything like that in the church today? Might there be? Anybody read 1 Corinthians chapter 5? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Young man is having relations with his father's wife. Doesn't tell me whether it's his mother or it's another woman that maybe his mother died. I don't know the answer to that question. But I do know this. It's, it's, it's a sin that even the Gentiles won't commit. That's what Paul said. Even the Gentiles don't go down that road. Does Paul pray and work with the people, the church, to try to get them right? And the answer is yes. You gotta turn you gotta withdraw fellowship from that fella. Don't have any dealings with him. In fact, Paul says, deliver him to Satan. But now watch it. For the destruction of the flesh that his soul may be saved. But what's the other purpose? Well, he says a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Uh <clears throat> I have something that's way more than a theory. I can, biblically can establish it. If you don't punish swiftly, more people are going to join in. If sin is not dealt with, there, there are going to be many more people join in. Well, if it's okay for him, it's okay for me. If it's okay for her, it's okay for me. That's the way that works. And that's basically what Paul says. We've got to deal with this for what sakes? For the sake of the church. The whole congregation could be led astray if we don't deal with this. So, uh, brethren, I think we've got two fronts to pray on. One, of course, is for the sinner. It's okay to pray for them. Now, you can't ask God to forgive them if they're unwilling to repent. And I can demonstrate that also. Uh, in fact, uh, John in 1 John talks about there is a sin unto death. But I don't tell you to pray for that. Say, well, what the sin unto death that appears to me is the unrepent. It's the sin of which somebody's unwilling to repent. They're not going to give it up. And there's no need me asking God to forgive somebody that won't repent because He's not going to do it. And that's not my prayer. Now, I can pray that God will, will open the door with them, <laughs> that God will help, help them be touched. I can do that. But I can't ask Him to forgive them if they won't repent, if they're not willing to change. But, so I've got to pray for the sinner, but I've also got to pray for the church, that we don't get influenced by the sinner and go off with them. You know, the world all around us trying to lead us astray. And every now and then, uh, that t 
pin that tries to get into the church. It tries. We've got to we got to work to keep it out of the church, uh, if if at all possible. All right, pick up now verse twenty three. So the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, "Speak to the congregation, saying, Get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram." Then Moses rose and went to Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation, saying, Depart now from the tents of these wicked men. Touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Dathan and Abiram came out and stood at the door of their tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works, for I have not done them of my own will. Notice, I didn't appoint myself ruler. See, that was what they accused him of. He said, I want you to know I didn't do that. Here it comes. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they're visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up, with all the, that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men rejected the Lord. It came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah and with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed over them, and they perished from among the assembly. And all Israel who were around them fled at their cry. For they said, Lest the earth swallow us up also. And a fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eliezer, the son of Aaron the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy and scattered the fire some distance away. They took those censers, of course, and, and used them. They made, they made them uh, as, as a, uh, a, a covering for the altar. What was the purpose of it? So that when people looked at it, they remembered what happened. It's a, it's a sign, if you would, a reminder that they had uh, that, that God had acted in this way. So that's uh, that's a part of a part of the remainder of that. God pleads, God, Moses pleads with God for his people. Now, who in here has ever felt like you don't have to raise your hand? Who's ever felt like God told you no? I'm going to dare say, if you've prayed very long, you felt that. That you've been down that road. Let's let's look at something. Look at Deuteronomy chapter three. Deuteronomy, yes. Okay. What what. Uh, what Drew said is he's impressed, because we've looked at several of those examples. He's impressed with the fact that Moses keeps going to God for the people. He keeps praying. He keeps, he keeps pleading for them. He doesn't give up on them. Uh, we, we, I, and he, he asked the question, I think it's a good one, do we sometimes give up on somebody? Do we, do we get say, well, we've prayed enough for them? Well, Moses didn't ever feel that way. He keeps praying. He keeps going to God for the people. And we've got to learn to do the same thing. We've got to be like him, uh, I think, in that. That's a, that's a good point. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 3, beginning at verse 23. Then I pleaded with the Lord at that time, saying, O Lord God, you begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, those pleasant mountains and Lebanon. 
But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough of that. Speak no more to me of this matter. Go up on top of Pisgah and lift your eyes toward the west, the north, the south, and the east. Behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan. But the command, but command Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him. For he shall go over before the people, and he shall cause them to inherit the land which you will see. So he stayed in the valley opposite Beth Peor. What what did Moses ask for? I want to go to the promised land. There are a couple of spots in Scripture, if if I read them and really begin to think what it would have been like to be that fella, I am I can literally be moved to tears. Here's a guy who's dedicated 40 years to serving God, leading these people. He has, as we've seen, pleaded with God for them over and over and over again. And now he just says, I, I, let me go in. Let me go see it. This is what he's been leading them for, toward for this whole time. Let me go see it. But he says, he himself relates that he's not, he's not worthy to, because of something they did that caused him to sin. So turn back to Numbers chapter 20. And I want us to notice a, a few factors that are involved here that I think are very important. Numbers chapter 20. This time we're going to begin at verse 1. One. Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month. And the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people continued with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. It may be referring now to Uh, to the rebellion that we talked about already. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord in this wilderness that we and our animals should die here? Why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? It is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. Remember, where are they going to? A land flowing with milk and honey. And what's their argument? You're not giving us what you told us. You know, you put this in modern day language, this is bait and switch, man. You told us we were going to a good place and we're, look what we're stuck with, this old desert where there's no water and nothing to eat. That's what they're saying. Now, what's the lesson here before he ever talks, before the conversation with God here? The lesson is, be careful. People can make you sin. I say make you. They can, they can stimulate you in a way that you, uh, that you're, you fall into it. You got control. Moses had control, and God's going to tell him so when all this comes along. So here we go. We keep going now. Verse 6. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation together, speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock, and give drink to the congregation and their animals. They went to go before God. This is what we do in prayer. God gave them instructions. Could they have done what was right? Pretty easy, yes, they could have. They could have done what was right. Keep going, because we're not not done yet. Pick up at verse 9. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him, and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock, and he said to them, Here now, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? And Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice, With his rod and water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Usually what we tell the children is, Moses was supposed to speak to the rock, and he struck it. 
That's really not the full story. Moses spoke, but what did he say? Have we got to do this for you? Ooh, who's going to give them water? Is it Moses? No, it's God. So the water came, no doubt about that. Now watch verse 12. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Why did Moses not enter the promised land? Because he allowed the people to push him until he failed to give God the glory. There is a message for us, I think. Our job all the time is to give God the glory. Now you can study other cases uh, where people didn't... uh, took credit effectively for God's work, or they didn't give God the glory, they didn't honor Him, and the result is always the same. God never will accept that kind of service. So, Moses teaches me a lot about prayer, including that I better, I better always hollow or honor, reverence God when I pray. I've told you weeks ago, I'll tell you again, I, that uh, that's what impressed me about Walter Johnson way back when, was that he always prayed, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. He always started with that honoring statement about God, and not one word that came out of his mouth ever lacked respect For the Almighty, what do we need to do? We need to have the same respect. Okay, really, talking to God doesn't stop with Moses. In fact, we're going to see it keeps going all the way through the Old Testament. We'll pick up on some other incidents. I want to go to the book of Joshua now. Now, we're going to skip over the first few chapters, not because they're not good, but we're not studying Joshua. We're studying times when God's people communicated with God. Children of Israel are just about ready to to do what God told them so that Jericho will fall. That's where where they are. So we get to the end of chapter 5, and in verse 13 we find, It came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, no. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Okay, comes in the form, as, in appearance, as a man. Who is he? Well, in the book of James, James chapter 5, you would, the word would be, he is Lord Sabaoth. Not Sabbath. Sabaoth. He is the commander of the armies of heaven. And those armies will be used. They are used by God. You see, uh, you see that on occasion. This is one of those. So then we find Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Now, because he receives worship, I know he's God. My suspicion and my contention has been that this is the angel of the Lord. It sounds so almost identical to Moses' first dealings with God in Exodus chapter 3 when we looked at the burning bush, if you remember. So then he says, Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. How do we have to approach God? With respect. Go back to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 10. This is another one of those stories that when we study it, we, we get some good points out of it, but maybe we miss one of the major points. Look at what happens. Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, 
Each took his censer and put fire in it and put incense on it and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. Uh, The English Standard Version in place of profane puts unauthorized. And that's really the word in the original language. This is... Uh, this was the achievement of my, for me of a lifetime with William Woodson. I wrote an article and sent it to him, and he said, does that translation translate that that way? He, it's the only time I ever told him anything he didn't already know. <laughs> In all those years. You know, that I, but he didn't, he didn't know this, but that's what it means. Uh, it means unauthorized. So uh, fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. You want to know why I, I get deeply disturbed if somebody starts taking a flippant attitude and and in prayer says, hey, Dad, it's because there's no respect. I don't see respect there. I don't approach God with a common term. I always with respect. Why? That's what he asked for. So Aaron held his peace. So why did they die? Because they, they didn't honor God. Then Moses called Mishael and Elizabeth. Okay, anyway, they end up uh, burning, uh, taking the bodies out and so forth. They're not allowed to cover their heads. They're not allowed to tear their clothes. No, they can't. They cannot, uh, at this moment, uh, go through the normal grieving process. Why not? Because these men fail to honor God. And God's not going to allow it. So now watch verse 8. Then the Lord spoke to Aaron saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink. You nor your sons with you when you go into the tabernacle of meeting lest you die. It should be a statue forever throughout your generations that you may distinguish between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean and that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. My suspicion, watch the word, it's a flag word. My suspicion is, Nadia and Abihu were drunk. Why? Why do I think that? Because God warns there, don't you go, don't you go serve me when you've been drinking alcohol. Don't you do it. Why? I am to be honored. That's why. Okay. So we got we gotten ourselves started with Joshua. We're going to finish Joshua uh, uh, next week, and we'll go on forward with some other Old Testament characters, uh, Lord willing. That's the plan anyway. All right. Thank you.